Hey everybody, and Tony here with the review of Wagner's Parsifal, live from the Bayreuther Festspielhaus, which I saw at the Sinister Cubics Theater in Alexanderplatz. The conductor was Hartmut Hähnchen. The production was done by Uwe Erik Laufenberg. The set designer was Gisbet Jekyll. The costumes were done by Jessica Karge. The lights were done by Reinhard Traub. The dramaturgy was handled by Richard Loba, and the chorus master was Eberhard Friedrich. I was mainly looking forward to this production, mostly because of the superb cast, which really looks awesome and phenomenal on paper, but I've yet to talk about them when I talk about the singers, and this was a new production of this particular opera, which made its premiere this year. With that said, let's get on to what I thought about the production, costumes, singing, conducting, and chorus. The production of this particular Parsifal starts off with the Knights of the Holy Grail sleeping in folding beds, and we have one night waking up to the crack of dawn, as if to say they now have to start their work, they now have to start their duties, as the day cannot wait any longer, and we see Gordon the Mons and his fellow knights and squires coming in as if though they were dressed up as monks, mainly Franciscan monks given the attire that they have. And we even have Kundri coming in, dressed up all in black, meditating. Then we even have Kundri dressed all in black and in a very Arabic style as well. And then we get to see the knights, the squires, Gwarnamans and Kundri having breakfast with bottled water and some bread until something has happened when a child comes in in the monastery and faints and while this is all happening we get to see people coming in to the monastery either for a tour or to pray and we even get to see some soldiers of the army coming in to inspect the place investigate the place if it's all safe if it's a-okay all undercover and we get to see them leave and enter from time to time as well now, while all of this is happening, Parsifal comes in, blonde-haired and wearing his hipster attire to state that he comes from the modernistic 21st century world as opposed to the monks and Kundri's way of life in the monastery with their simplicity and their detachment from worldly things. And I thought this was rather interesting because this definitely represents some outside force coming in. And at the same time, we have more outside forces, like how we have the men constantly chasing after Kundri after she gives Gornamans the bomb in which she has obtained from her journey to Arabia. And we even see a statue of the crucifix and with Jesus all naked and without his crown of thorns and his nails almost nowhere to be found until we find out much later of what happens with the unveiling of the grail via Amfuatas, Titorel, and all the other knights of the Holy Grail. And after that, we see Amfuatas coming in dressed all in white and what I also seem to notice about the entire monastery is that it seems to have been very much torn by war. It looks tattered. It looks very much just dis almost destroyed. And the tub in which Amfotas goes in for his healing bath is filled to the brim with mildew, mold, and a lot of other disgusting things. But still the water looks relatively clean. Quite questionable but I probably would have loved to have a cleaner tub, basically all of porcelain and something that looks really, really clean for the likes of someone like Amfotas, who is the King of the Grails, and just for him to make sure that his bath is quote unquote healthy. Along the line, when we see the unveiling of the Grail, we see Amfotas coming in with the crown of thorns and his white garments. And once he's about to unveil the grail, we first hear the voice of his father, Titorel, until he comes in on stage, 
not really as an old, old man, but as an old enough man, enough to state that he is at the end of his life and is about to give his life to his own son, Amphuatas, and all of the knights of the Holy Grail. And we see Amphuatas stripped to the white loincloth, and we see wounds all over his body, especially the wound on his left rib, the one that Jesus had as well. Not only does he have that wound right there from the spear, which could not be healed, but he has many other wounds which he obtained in the past mostly because of his service, not only as the king of the Holy Grail, but also as a knight as well, also as someone who fought for the name of the Holy Grail, who fought for the name of his savior, who fought for his country and land of his birth, Monsalvat. He's basically someone who was not only a king, but a warrior, and his build also proves without any shadow of a doubt that he was once upon a time also a warrior. But because of him encountering Kundri and being tempted by her, he fell from grace and has obtained all the wounds, not only psychologically, but physically as well. They cannot be healed. Whether he fasts, whether he does a lot of things like self-mortification, experience stigmatas, and does everything he can, those wounds he had could not be healed. And he suffers, especially as he stands on that round table. It then takes the efforts of two knights and the four squires to do as what happened with Jesus. As in, they take a surgical knife, and this was very much the part in which I was almost about to choke, mostly from sadness and worry and just a lot of really strong emotions coming through me as they take that surgical knife and pierce his wound and see blood gushing out everywhere from his head leading up to his feet. And they use that aforementioned blood as wine to symbolize that this is yet another stigmata that Amphotas is going through as he is going through the similar process that Jesus went through as in first having his side pierced by a Roman soldier with first blood gushing out and then after that the last miracle came with water gushing out from that side. And I thought even though this wasn't really the most subtle portrayal of Christ in general in this opera, I thought it managed to really add a good amount of symbolism given the fact that this opera, as I'm going to say this once and again, is about redemption not just a Christ-like redemption, but a redemption in general for people who want to be free from their wrongdoings, free from their past transgressions, and who would do whatever it takes to make sure that they have that Savior, obtain that Savior, and accept that Savior for them to really be free from all that. So it was definitely tough to talk about this, but I felt like it was kind of invigorating, kind of shocking, and just a huge mixture of strong emotions really brewing through me from that scene alone. And then we go to Klingzor's palace. Basically, it's an Arabian palace where we see Amfortas being tied up and gagged, and Klingzor has a huge collection of icons of Christ on the cross. And of course, in the original version, Klingzor is basically an evil wizard. In this production, we see that Klingzor is a hypocritical, fear-mongering, hateful, a radicalist Jesus freak who thinks that just by collecting all the Jesus statues, 
he can feel saved and be able to join the Knights of the Holy Grail. Which is rather interesting because we usually know Klingzor as the evil wizard who is very much a pagan who wanted to join the Holy Grail, but as Gornamans described in detail, he had to be castrated in order to try to join the Holy Grail because he was not accepted, mostly because of his sinful lifestyle. So the only way to basically try to be accepted was to castrate himself, but that didn't work. And he has his harem of really beautiful maidens initially dressed up all in black with their entire body being covered with the exception of their eyes. And going back to where Umfotas is, this basically becomes not only a mission to save Umfotas from his wound, but also to save Umfotas from the clutches of Klingzor so that he won't suffer the same fate as he did. And while we get to the flower maiden scene, the flower maidens were more than just flower maidens, but rather they were very much the favorites of Klingzor. First coming in dressed up as the traditional ladies of the harem were dressed all in black and having their entire body covered with the exception of their eyes. And once they see Parsifal come in dressed up in his army attire, they then decide to have their way with him because, well, he's about their age, he's quite young like them, and just basically show him a life of pleasure, a life of having all these charming and really pretty girls after him. Kondri comes in as almost like a procurus to also state that she knew Parsifal from many, many years back. What's also interesting from the second act is that we don't see the spear being thrown at him. We see Klingzor first trying to attack Parsifal with the spear, but Parsifal ends up breaking the spear as if to say, from a spear that is so full of hypocrisy, radicalism, pain, and many other negative facets of religion and life in general, he turns that into a spear of love, redemption, and truth just by breaking it and forming a cross using the broken spear in order to vanquish Klingzor to prove that he no longer has power over that spear and Kundri basically sinking to the ground, just totally losing it and weeping over the fact that what is she going to do with the rest of her life when Parsifal says that he will return. And in the third act, we see Kundri as an old woman, someone who is very much in the state of her life where she feels that she has lived a very long, painful, and very much an anguish-filled life where she has been searching for many, many years for redemption after that misdeed of laughing at Christ on the cross and therefore lived with the curse and is now seen as a shriveled old woman who almost doesn't really have that much strength in her system to move around until she is revived by Gurnamans, by basically putting some water in her face and a little bit of water in her mouth. And she only wants to serve, anoint, and help others before she ends up cacking it. And we see Kondri basically doing the usual thing with Parsifal when he comes in, washing his feet first, and then drying them with her hair, anointing his feet, and Gordon the Munz does the same thing as well. The big question was, and this goes to a lot of the other productions, whatever happened to the Flower Maidens? Well, in this production, we see that the Flower Maidens have very much reformed from seductive minxish young women to 
young women who are on the verge of living a normal and everyday life full of honesty and just trying to be accepted by the general society. We always wonder, whatever happened to the flower maidens? Usually they vanish alongside with Klingzo, but in this opera, Klingzo ends up being destroyed by Parsifal, and we see that the flower maidens are now living their lives as happy young women who don't need sex in order to make their lives exciting and just need to really just live their lives off as everyday young women. Before the final scene of the opera, we see a waterfall gushing down with the faces of Kundri, Amfortas, and even Richard Wagner himself, as if to say, with Kundri, she has lived her life that was so full of guilt, anguish, anger, schizophrenia, and all of those other messed up emotions, all of those other messed up feelings. But thanks to Parsifal and thanks to his courage and thanks to his newfound wisdom, she can now rest in peace. And with Amfuatas, he too has lived a life where he fell from grace, where he fell from his grace as the king, and he too can rest in peace and find a new successor in Parsifal. With Richard Wagner's face, we see that he has lived a long enough life as a composer, and this opera, Parsifal, was his last big hurrah before he ended up passing away and just basically left a legacy for this opera and a lot of his other operas as well. And we have the final scene where Amfotas sees the tomb of his father and it's filled with ashes and Parsifal comes in with a spear. He lays it right there and he puts the spear inside the coffin of Titorel. Everyone leaves the opera. We only see the coffin and the spear inside as if to say, with Parsifal's journey, this is only just the beginning. And I have to say that the production, it's really strong all throughout. And you could really tell that it's definitely a very exciting production all throughout because of the thought and just how much heart it definitely has even though at times it can be quite unsubtle, but the message still lives on in terms of redemption and in terms of really finding a savior. And the costumes were absolutely gorgeous and very much interesting in their own special ways. I especially love the costumes of the Flower Maidens. So I'm not gonna mince words here. The production and the costumes were quite exciting and interesting in their own special ways. Sure, some people might end up disagreeing with me. Some people might agree with me. Others might feel rather iffy about my overall thoughts on the production. But I thought it was still a very awesome production in its own special way, even though it did have loads and loads of moments where a lot of the unsubtleties are shown. And now we get to the singers, starting off with our main hero, Parsifal, sung by Klaus Florian Vogt. He has been singing this role for many years, and I really love the fresh, youthful timbre that he produces in this title role. Yes, he may not have that more metallic quality of a lot of Heldentin was, as I've seemed to notice a lot in previous productions where I saw him, but I have to give him loads of credit for still being a very awesome and very mellifluous musician in his own special way. Sure, his voice may not sound like a Helden Tenwa, let alone a strong dramatic tenor, but it still maintains that youthfulness, that brightness, and that really fine tone, which I love in any Parsifal. I still have to give him credit for what he had to accomplish in this really demanding title role. And then we have Kundri, sung by the Russian Wagnerian soprano, Elena Pankratova. Over the years, Madame Pankratova has started off with singing a lot of the full lyric and spinto soprano roles and has found herself 
transitioning to the more dramatic soprano roles. And nowadays, she is specializing in a lot of these Wagnerian soprano roles like Turandot, Ortrud, Venus, Kundry, and of course, Zeglinde, which she did with Jennifer Wilson when they were in Spain performing Valkyra. She was absolutely fabulous as Kundry, making her a very multidimensional character, and she basically kind of downplayed Kundry and didn't make her too wild or too over the top or too angsty. She made sure that she paced herself as an actress, but if there is one asset that she has that really, really defined her in this character, it's her voice. It's homogenous. It's something that I really love in any true Wagnerian soprano. It's dark hued. It is mellifluous throughout all the registers, whether she sings the chest notes, whether she sings the middle notes, or even when she sings the high notes. The high notes especially are so clarion and so thrilling that makes you wonder why she's always in demand for roles like Turandot, Zieglinde, Artrud, Kundry, The Dyer's Wife, Elektra, and many, many, many other Wagnerian or Hochdramatische Sopran roles. She did fabulously as Kundry, even in the third act. You really get to see the anguish that Kundri has in her old age because you know damn well that she has lived a life full of anguish and pain and she knows that she is going to cack it at the end of the opera and she knows that her time on this earth or what is left of it is really ticking and she definitely portrayed it very well. And when she sees the now reformed former flower girls, she very much becomes like an auntie or a mother figure to them, which I have to say, she did very, very wonderfully. She's been singing this role for quite some time and she continues to find a lot of awesome colors with this character and a lot more awesome facets with this very demanding role. I have to give my huge, huge kudos to someone like Madame Pankratova for really embodying this character. She was an absolute pro as Kundri and she won me over theatrically and more than anything vocally. Then we go to Amforta, sung by, by the bear hunk. Well, technically he is a bass baritone. Ryan McKinney who I've been hearing a lot of awesome things about. And from what I've been seeing from his interpretation of Amfotas, he has a very cutting and very athletic physique, powerful, yet not too muscular. And it's sleek. It's a very sleek physique that he uses very well. It's athletic, it's quite muscular, and he stood really tall and really engaging himself in this role, which he managed to sing with pathos, poignancy, and an overall urgency, which really, really made him exciting in this embodiment of Amfuatas. He not only played Amfuatas, but he embodied him to a T. He had the physique, he had the overall poignancy, and he was an absolute pro, really embodying this character to the best of his ability. His singing was of the highest order. I've been reading a lot about his repertoire, stating that he has sung a lot of, ro a lot of roles from the deep basso roles to the traditional bass baritone roles to some of the dramatic baritone parts. That just shows you right there how much of an awesomely versatile singer this gentleman really is. And now we go to the lower voices, starting off with Titorel, sung by Karl Heinz Lena, who has a very superb basso cantante slash basso profondo voice, which he manipulates very well, and his stage presence as Titorel is strong, 
handsome and very dignified. He is a very fine musician and a very awesome actor. And then we have Georg Zeppenfeld as Gurnemanns, truly one of the big stars of this production as he continues to use his basso cantante voice to the best of his abilities and really embodying Gurnemanns to the best of his abilities as well. He was born to embody Gurnemanns. He was Gurnemanns. It's no wonder why we, the audience, felt so enthralled by his performance because he embodied this character to a T. He gave him diligence, he gave him wisdom, he gave him intelligence, and he gave him a lot of great facets, which makes Gormans a very awesome character. Then we go to Klingsor, sung by the superb German Helden baritone Gerd Grochowski, which he manages to really embody this tremendously villainous character extremely well. He was born to play such villainous parts. Look no further than his embodiments of Telramund, Alberich, Wotan. Well, he's mainly a very ambiguous character, but you know what I mean. Johanna, yet another ambiguous character, but nearly on the side of heroic. And of course, Klingsor. He also did him Fortas as well. And he really gives the goods of this thankless character because of his really awesome Helden Baritone voice that really can hit a lot of the low notes, at the same time have that menacing, biting, threatening tone, which he is very much well known for and has basically used as his calling card. There's no one like Signor Grochowski who can really give Klingsor his menace. Of course, we had his predecessors, like the likes of Gustav Neidlinger and Gunther von Kannen, to name the few. But with Gerd Grochowski, he really gives that bite and menace to really make Klingsor a very threatening character. And he was born to play all of these scary and villainous roles. Then we have the two Knights of the Grail, sung by Tanzel Akshebek and Timo Rihonen who both did very fabulously. With Timo Rihonen, he has a very awesome basso profondo voice, and he has an awesome, awesome future ahead of him. Who knows? In a few years' time, he is going to sing either Titurel or Gurnemans, as I could really tell from the color of his voice. It's noble, it's fresh, and it's cavernous. He definitely has an awesome and bright future ahead of him. And with Tansel Aksebek, he has a superb light lyric tenor voice, which he uses very well in this fine character role. And both these gentlemen really sang very, very well. Then we go to the four squires. Alexander Steiner, who has a very superb light lyric soprano voice, sparkling and silvery all throughout. Marika Moore, who has an awesome lyric mezzo voice, also very scintillating and very homogenous and warm. Charles Kim, who has a very superb light lyric tenor voice, which can sound spinto at times, but that's just to the best of his advantages because he's a very awesome musician and an equally fine actor in this extremely thankless part. And Stefan Heibach, who also has an excellent lyric tenor voice and a very fine stage presence. And all of these four singers did fabulously as the four squires. And then we go to the flower maidens with Anna Ziminska's lovely coloratura soprano voice, Katarina Perzika's light lyric soprano voice, which sounds so lovely and gorgeous, Marika Moore's trademark warm lyric mezzo voice, Alexandra Steiner's trademark light lyric silvery soprano voice, Bele Kumberga's gorgeous, scintillating, and silvery light lyric soprano voice, and Ingeborg Gilebo's warm lyric mezzo voice. These ladies did absolutely fabulously as the six flower maidens and even Wiebke Lehmkuhl's mezzo contralto voice as the voice from above. She really had a commanding voice which she used very very well. 
So overall, the singing is phenomenal. The standouts were, without a doubt, Herr Zeppenfeld, Herr Grochowski, Madame Pantratova, Mr. McKinney, and Herr Lena. They did fabulously. And I also have to give loads of kudos to Herr Vogt for continuing to be a very superb musician because of his musicality and because of his intelligence to the part as well, even though he may not have that traditional Wagnerian tenor bite. And the conducting done by Hot Wutenchen was absolutely superb, really paying close attention to the text, and the chorus of the Bayreuther Festspielhaus was absolutely awesome. So overall, I have to say that everything about this production was absolutely phenomenal. From the production itself, to the costumes, to the singers, to the conducting and chorus, everyone really pulled it off together. And they just made my evening very much worth looking forward to. And yes, this was definitely hard to put together because it, everything was just so well done. At times, I felt like I had to really make sure that I didn't say anything mean or anything that was condescending. And they just basically blew my expectations out of the water. Everyone did phenomenally. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in tomorrow where I have a blast in the past in 2013 with a production from Bari, Italy, with Bellini's La Sonambula, starring Jessica Pratt and John Osborne and Paolo Pecchioli as the main love triangle of Amina, Elvino, and Contralolfo. So until then, have an awesome night, everybody.